Insurers promising to cover crop over events amid concerns about safety and security. Some Bridgetown businesses reporting an uptick in sales of the crop over season. And a local doctor worried about the impact of hot weather on the young, elderly and obese people. And in sports, West Indies ready to take on India in the first test tomorrow in Dominica. Broadcasting from our studios in the Pine St. Michael, this is CBC News Night, starting now. A very good evening to you with CBC News Night. I'm Ryan Broom in our top story. An assurance tonight to party and FET organizers that public liability and related insurance cover are still being provided for the various crop over events across the island. The president of the General Insurance Association of Barbados, Randy Graham, made the comments in the aftermath of the recent invasion of the powder event by a number of mostly young people who bombarded the venue and scaled the fences, in a few cases causing disruption and injury. He says while the situation has prompted more scrutiny by insurance providers, he says it certainly does not mean an end to the provision of cover. What happened with the event is unfortunate, but I think it's important to realize that the insurance sector in Barbados has supported the Crop Over Festival for many years and will long continue to support the festival. We saw a situation there where there was an event, and I, I didn't attend the event myself, but my understanding is that they, they had some disruption to the event from some patrons who did not pay and caused some damage, and obviously that would that would create some security concerns, not just for, for us, but it would create security concerns for, for the agents on a whole, right? They would have seen it and made their own estimations as to whether that was a safe environment or not. Um, but truth be told, that event had insurance, and um, the, the event that was to follow also had an opportunity to have to have insurance. So uh, it's not that the insurance was not available; is that the, the you know the insurance companies asked additional questions because of the safety of the event, which I think is is reasonable. Um, but then the insurance com companies did offer cover um, to to the event, and, and we will offer cover to future events as well. And Mr. Graham says the measures and adjustments being taken now will help dictate the approach taken ahead of any such events in the future. What I would expect to happen is that people will start asking more security questions about these events in the future. I don't think the events will stop. I don't think that insurance will stop on the events. But I think it's reasonable for, for persons to now ask, I mean, what would the security be like? What, where would the location be like? I think it, that, uh, you know, where the logistics and the, the areas that we are able to host these events in the future is going to become a, a, the big question. We don't have a national stadium anymore. Uh, so where exactly do we have appropriate security and, and appropriate walls and and barriers. I mean, where, where, where can we host these type of events? So I think that's going to be a big question. Where can we host them and how can we get the security at the event appropriate so that patrons are safe at the event? In other festival news, some Bridgetown businesses are seeing spikes in sales as Barbados prefer for the various events on the calendar. Ariane Phillips has more. Hair, nails and eyelashes are among the top sellers as Barbadians enhance their appearance for the various crop over events. Number one beauty supply has been a one-stop shop for many, as operation manager Charmaine Durant explains. We've seen um, a rise in sales somewhat since June. I think from the end of May into June that we started to see rising sales because there are lots of activities going on. So customers, they want more hair, they want more makeup. The lashes come off a little earlier than before. So they're getting themselves ready for each and every activity they have. And this year, the activities are a lot more than we've ever had before. You will get crochet here. Um, that still lasts a little longer. But for, you know, certain types of our customers, they prefer um, the shorter styles or the bobs or something they could change according to the event they're going to. So um, everything is actually selling. And plus we're going into summer. So braids are selling going into the summer. And then the, like the solo green, the yaki hair, that sells as well. Women have also been seeking both large and small service providers for the application of makeup and eyelash extensions. So we get customers coming daily, like they last like two, three weeks, some people four, but it's a constant something. So activities are not persons come to get the lashes do. But now we will do more full face makeup and um, drawing of the eyebrows. You have a lot more of that because of the activities that we have going on. Makeup is the forefront because everybody going to want to look nice for the events. So with that being said, for sure, you know, it's, it's the makeup. Mostly, it's been for the fact so far. Um, with the events coming up, we have plenty of bookings in already. And fabrics have been in demand. 
Over at Abes, people have been buying materials for custom outfits, while some band leaders have opted to source materials locally. Apart from the obvious, which is what the community bands and the smaller bands are doing, which would be the trim and the carnival decorations and the feathers and the spandex and so on to make the costumes, we're also seeing a very large market this year for four-day mourning. Um, where obviously it's a lot more casual, it's not as structured, but equally it's fluorescent spandex, it's hologram spandex, anything with stretch is hugely popular this year. Uh, and the fets, again, it's, I suppose the best way to describe it, less is more. As skimpy as the outfits could be is as good as people want it to be. So again, stretch is important. Business is expected to increase towards the end of the month and into the first week of August as the festival climaxes. Rianne Phillips, CBC News. Thanks, Rianne. Well, Barbados has made a call for more decisive action from United Nations member states in attaining the 17 Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. Prime Minister Mia Amor Motley, who is also the co-chair of the Sustainable Development Goals Advocates Group, delivered this message during a high-level political forum on sustainable development to launch the special edition report. Now, the main objectives of the ongoing high-level event are to discuss the latest data and recommendations on progress towards the SDGs and provide a platform for leaders to share their insights and calls to action for accelerating progress. The 17 goals were adopted by all UN member states in 2015 as part of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, which set out a 15-year plan to achieve the goals. If we are to be guardians of our future generations, then we must ensure that we do everything in our power to secure a sustainable future. Earlier this year, the Secretary General of the United Nations proposed a stimulus to assist with advancing the 2030 Agenda. The SDG stimulus aims to offset challenging market conditions faced by developing countries and to accelerate progress through the SDGs through investments in renewable energy, universal social protection, decent job creation, health care, quality education, sustainable food systems, urban infrastructure, and, of course, digital transformation. The stimulus also calls for a significant increase in financing for sustainable development to the tune of at least $500 billion per year. And Prime Minister Motley says the current debt crisis, along with the inability of developing countries to access affordable finance, limits their ability to invest in the SDGs. And meanwhile, Justin Trudeau, Canada's Prime Minister and the other co-chair of the Sustainable Development Goals Advocates Group, says it's vital countries work together to meet the targets. In 2021, we doubled our international climate finance commitment to $5.3 billion. This will help developing countries fight climate change and address biodiversity loss around the world. And it will help low- and middle-income countries already dealing with the impacts of climate change build sustainable, climate-resilient economies and futures. We all need to be a part of this work. And with only seven years until 2030, we must seize this moment with urgency and excitement. J'ai bien hâte de travailler avec vous tous au cours des mois et des années à venir pour atteindre des résultats tangibles pour le bien des gens qu'on représente. So let's roll up our sleeves, keep doing the hard work of building a better world. Meanwhile, Barbados has received a multi-million dollar boost in its efforts to better finance climate resilience and action. The Barbados-based Blue Green Bank has received a 15 million U.S. dollar injection. This after the board of the Green Climate Fund, the world's largest climate fund in Incheon, Korea, approved the investment. This provides the bank with a capital base of more than $80 million and a capacity to lend $500 million to invest in green affordable homes, assisting with providing hurricane-resilient roofs, the electrific electrification of transport and other Paris-aligned investments. Prime Minister Motley says government sees the Blue-Green Bank playing a particularly critical role in accelerating our transition to net zero, boosting resilience, enfranchising workers, drawing private sector investment, and prudently managing public finances and public debt levels. 
In other news now, a medical doctor wants Barbadians to be aware of the serious health risks from really hot weather. The beginning of July was the hottest week on record as a series of searing days saw global temperature records fall. Now, Dr. Adrian Lord called attention to heat strokes, heat cramps, and other heat fainting, noting those at risk include the very young, the elderly, and people who are obese. He wants people to ensure they consume adequate amounts of fluid. Dr. Lord was a guest on CBC TV 8's Morning Report. Many times you don't recognize that you're really dehydrated or becoming dehydrated because of the lack of thirst. Thirst is not a sensitive indication of your dehydration. Thirst comes on long after you're, you're really dehydrated. So you need to keep your fluids up and water or sports drinks. Are, that, those are the best things that are recommended for these conditions. Um, wear light clothing. Um, like colored clothing and light clothing, wear uh, a hat or use an umbrella if you're going to be out in, in the sun for long periods of time, um, and things like that. Use the shades, walk in the shade if you have to, if you have to do, have to be out there if possible. The Central Bank of Barbados has issued a statement in response to a video circulating purporting to show a counterfeit bill from the newest series of banknotes. The bank suggests the note, which it acknowledges has some of the genuine security features, appears to have come into contact with a harsh chemical that removed some of the ink. The bank says to date it has received no fake notes from the 2022 Polymer Banknote series, but reminds the public they are not impossible to counterfeit. Anyone with a note they suspect to be counterfeit is advised to take it to a commercial bank or to the central bank. The bank is also encouraging people to continue to check their money using the security features incorporated in them. Now, these features include a transparent window near the bottom of the note and an image embedded in the window that catches a light on lower denominations and changes color on higher denominations. We'll take a break here, but coming up, news about this year's Junior Chef Cook-Off competition. But the 12 finalists of this year's Junior Chef Cook-Off competition have been announced. Director of Public Relations and Corporate Communications with the Barbados Tourism Marketing Incorporated, April Thomas, says it comes as they continue to place emphasis on nurturing young talent as part of the overall tourism package. Ms. Thomas says it's really important for the BTMI to build on last year's Food and Rum Festival through initiatives such as the Junior Chef Cook-Off competition. This, as the festival has been nominated to be one of the Caribbean's best food festivals. This year, we really thought that, you know, we are the Barbados Tourism Marketing Inc. And we're not quite a food entity, we're a tourism entity. And the reason we have the Barbados Funarum Festival is to showcase the culinary landscape of Barbados. But it's all about tourism. It's all about telling people all over the world, you know, this is what Barbados has to offer. Over 400 eateries, whether it's a shop on the beach or a fine dining restaurant, there's so much to offer. So we knew that this year we wanted to integrate those components into our um, festival. We have a huge product department that does a lot of this, working with a lot of these restaurants um, and various tourism attractions in general. And so this year we're making sure that we integrate that component of it by taking the students out and putting them in the field so that they can see, you know, what these culinary talents in Barbados do on a daily basis. Now the 12 chefs who will undergo an intense eight-week training exercise with noted chef Peter Eady include Reese Ann Aleen, Kobe Balgobin, Raphael Blenman, Gabrielle Bino, Achan Callender, Cyan Edwards, Dewan Toppin, Dominique Grant, Roger Griffith, Jade Harewood, Ashania Tate, and Maya Thornhill. Now, Ms. Thomas says there will be an effort during training to take the students through the farm to table concept. And meanwhile, a few of the young chefs shared their experiences so far. I'm very excited to be a part of these 12 contestants to compete in the Food and Room comp Cook-Off. The selection process was very intense. They were asking me a lot of diff difficult questions. I found it very easy to answer questions. The selection process was intense for me. Um, they asked me a question that like, if you had 15 minutes, what was your first three ingredients you would pick up? And just like Reese, I picked the mango and the coconut because I would do a strawberry or ice cream. I'm very excited to be one of the final 12. I'm feeling very lucky also. The selection process, it, was, it wasn't bad. It went pretty well. The questions were quite precise, but very comfortable to answer. Um, I had mentioned my like for bartending, so they asked me a dish that I would prepare with 
uh, started, I would prepare with a cocktail, and I had mentioned a old fashioned, as well as uh, just a small lamb with a bed of mixed leaves on an orange and thyme vinaigrette. The preparations continue for the state funeral of late Prime Minister, the Right Honorable Sir Lloyd Erskine Sandiford. Earlier today, a full rehearsal was held beginning with a procession from Batley St. Peter along Queen Street and ending at the St. Peter's Parish Church where the service will be held. It involved a gun carriage and troops from the Barbados Police Service and the Barbados Defense Force accompanied by a marching band. Those on hand to ensure the proceedings go smoothly on Friday included Ministerial Coordinator Labor Minister Colin Jordan, Commissioner of Police Richard Boyce and Chief of Staff of the Barbados Defense Force Commodore Errington Sherlin. Minister Jordan confirmed that preparations are going well. Now, after leaving the church, the troops proceeded to Sunset Crest St. James to rehearse the procession to the St. James Cemetery for the interment. Crews were busy preparing the site when a CBC team visited. Now, this next story might be a bit disturbing to some, mainly those who don't like to see creepy crawlies. Now, some farm roads in Peter residents have been disturbed by thousands of non-human visitors, which are literally turning up at their doorsteps day and night. Many residents told CBC the worm-like creature, creatures, which have been out in their numbers for the last couple of weeks, first appeared from an overgrown lot filled with river tamarind situated to the east of their homes. Some woke up to find their houses covered with the creatures, while others found several dead ones at their doorsteps. The sightings have forced residents to keep their homes buttoned down around the clock and disturb their way of life. Now, entomologist Ian Gibbs spoke to CBC News identifying the creature. Most likely, it is a species of moth um, belonging to the family Erebidae, and the species in particular appears to be that of um, Meliportis. From Melica. Now, Meliportis um, feeds periodically on um, on the River Tambrin, and you get them in very large numbers, um, so much so that they will strip the tree of leaves, defoliate it completely. Otherwise, they really don't pose any threat to any other crop um, or, or ornamentals. The only thing that they could either be is, is a nuisance to people because they um, will be in, in pretty large numbers, but they don't, wouldn't, they don't do anybody anything. And a resident who spoke to us off camera on behalf of the community says it is time for the overgrown lot harboring the creature to be cleared by the authorities. I feel the area want the bushing. All the trees, they really want cleaning up. That's what I can tell you. It really want cleaning up. Both sides of the streets. Come and clean up the area. The area needs cleaning up because people want to use it as a dump also. As you can see for yourself, it wants cleaning up. You understand? That's it. In tonight's Yes Business Report, we hear about a recent collaboration with the Youth Entrepreneurship Scheme and the Pinelands Creative Workshop. And we also find out more about the upcoming Yes Summer Enterprise Program, which is actively seeking camp assistance between the ages of 19 and 25 years old. Yes, recently took part in the Pinelands Creative Workshop's annual CAM program, which is in its 23rd season as a five-day development conference. Now, this year's program was held at the Samuel Japman Prescott Institute of Technology, or SJPI campus, under the theme, Rethinking the Workplace, Defining the New World of Work. And that's where the team from Yes came in on the final day of the exercise, sharing important information about the range of services and opportunities for young people offered by Yes, but also talking about the upcoming Yes Summer Enterprise Prize program. Acting manager of Yes, Ryan Mosley, and director of the Summer Enterprise Program, Celia Collimore, made the main presentations, also touching on some important best practices and approaches when it comes to starting and maintaining successful small businesses. So many opportunities that come to me, come to my brand, not because I went searching for them, but because of my relationships with people and people who know what I do, they're able to make referrals for me. Right? There's a, a, a concept that I learned a couple of years ago, and it said your network is your network, net worth. And I believe that with all of my heart. 
because especially last year, I got so many business opportunities and it wasn't because of me. It was because of my network sending business my way and it continues to happen. So as an entrepreneur, it's great that you have the talent, it's great that you have that product, it's great that you have that service, but you have to be able to build relationships with people, have the right attitude. Yes, be able to support people as well because people will work on your behalf. When people, when you work with people you know, like and trust and vice versa, if they know you, like you and trust you, trust me, they will help to support your business. Meanwhile, manager of Yes, Ryan Mosley, introduced the concept of the Summer Youth Enterprise Program to the students gathered. We have a program called the Summer Enterprise Program, which comes under the National Summer Camp Program. Now listen carefully to this. If you all are interested in business, very passionate about pursuing business in another couple of years, Yes is offering a summer enterprise program this year specifically for you who have a passion for getting into business. And Director Celia Collymore provided more details about the Youth Summer Enterprise Program. Camp Enterprise is for ages 13 to 17. Everyone within that age range, 13 to 17, good. And the program is starting July 24th, and it goes till August 24th. So one month, we're going to be at Parkinson Memorial School. And like Ryan said, it, it is completely free. You're going to get a lot of experiences there. So you're going to do the personal development, like Ryan said. You're going to do the business training, the entrepreneurship training. But you also get to meet not only myself, but you're going to get to meet other entrepreneurs. You're going to get to learn from these entrepreneurs as well. You're going to get to network with these entrepreneurs. You never know. You never know what can happen when you're in, in a space connecting with a new and different people. We also have business tours. So we get on those coach buses and we go into different spaces and we learn about different businesses around the island. And we get to have some fun as well. So you're going to do team building and we're going to do some fun stuff on site as well as off site. I Meanwhile, there's a special call going out for camp assistants between the ages of 19 and 25 to be a part of the summer enterprise program. It's intended to run for five weeks. University of the West Indies and Barbados Community College students who want to satisfy their give back hours are being given special priority to fill those camp assistant positions. Now, if you are interested in being a camp assistant or want to find out more on behalf of a relative, please give them a call at 535-3878-932-7413 or 256-3093. That's 535-3878. 932-7413 or 256-3093. Well, the Korean Barbados Resort is reporting favorable occupancy as the hotel prepares for the summer months ahead and the much busier winter period later this year. General Manager Christopher Forbes made the remarks as he announced their partnership with the BTMI for this year's Junior Chef Cook-Off competition through the resort's five restaurants. Here at the Crane, we are 270 suites, 36 permanent residents, and more being built at this time. And we anticipate for this coming winter uh, a, a very uh, high occupancy, meaning that anywhere from now, like today, we have over 331 uh, guests on our property to over almost 1,000 guests on our property. So you will be able to experience the pace of any of the restaurants as well as the cuisine, working with the ladies and gentlemen that are there, both from the back of the house as well as the front of the house. Time now for the second round of sports. So we head back over to the sports studio. Welcome back, Damien Best. Yeah, thanks so much, Ryan. Well, the Trinidad and Tobago National Women's T20 and T10 Champion Team Hibiscus Club is on the island to participate in a series of matches organized by the Hamilton Lashley Foundation. The team arrived earlier today and was greeted by organizer and former MP Hamilton Lashley. They are set to play two T20s and a 40-over a match starting tomorrow against a select Barbados 11 women's team before engaging in the inaugural Catherine Marina Paul T6 tournament.
Now tomorrow's first T20 is set for 2 p.m. at the 3Ws Oval before moving to the Map Hill ground on Thursday. The 40-over aside match is set for Friday at Glebe in St. George. Then on Saturday, the T6 Cricket Classic will get underway. Well, that's our news package on behalf of the entire crew. Thanks for being with us over the past hour and do have a good night.